Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and for some of you, it would be good morning. This is Maureen Dobbins from uh, Health Evidence uh, coming to you today with uh, a webinar on an issue related to the social determinants of health. And I'm very excited uh, to be presenting uh, this uh, webinar or to be hosting this webinar, which is actually a unique uh, partnership between Health Evidence uh, this funded CIHR project and the National Collaborating Centre for Determinants of Health, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that uh, in a moment. So, um, Kara's been through uh, uh, some housekeeping issues, so I hope uh, you have, um, uh, all the issues have been uh, resolved. And uh, just to clarify uh, that everyone is on the right call, that the evidence that we are discussing today is a review uh, called Assessing the Impact and Effectiveness of Intersectoral Action on the Social Determinants of Health, an Expedited Systematic Review. Uh, that was funded by uh, the NCCDH, Social Determinants, uh, and the National Collaborating Centre for uh, Determinants of Health. As well, uh, following the webinar today, we will be posting the PowerPoint up onto the Health Evidence website, as well in English and French, a uh, four-page summary of this larger document, uh, a summary statement that has been written that outlines uh, the evidence as well as potential implications for policy and practice. So again, uh, if you are experiencing any difficulties um, in terms of the connection please contact uh, WebEx at the number that's listed below here, 1-866-229-3239. Uh, Kara DeCorby, uh, who has also uh, coordinated this event for today, uh, is also online to assist uh, with any other issues that you may have. So it really is my pleasure uh, to have you joining us today. We, I see the numbers are continuing to rise. We have about 150 people on the phone today. We try to be 
very transparent in how we determine uh, which reviews are relevant uh, to public health and therefore make it into health evidence, as well as how we assess the methodological quality uh, in terms of our tools, how we assign keywords, as well as the process that we use in writing summary statements and posting those to the website. So all of that is also accessible to users of health evidence to understand what we're doing. In addition to providing this resource, we have also been evaluating and studying through mostly uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research funded uh, dollars uh, uh, the, the impact of knowledge translation strategies in public health. And what we've learned from these multiple studies over the years is that uh, having access to the evidence on its own is not enough for uh, supporting and promoting evidence-informed decision-making. And so as a result of the, of the uh, many interventions that we've been evaluating over the years, we've created and made available other, other supports that uh, public health decision makers can use, uh, either internally in their organizations or at even a broader, uh, perhaps provincial, federal level, to support evidence-informed decision making uh, at all levels of public health. Uh, these can include uh, tools to help guide a search, uh, tools on uh, how to, again, how to appraise the evidence, uh, tools to keep track of your decision making processes. So all of those additional supports are also available to you through uh, health evidence. And finally, and most importantly, is trying to keep all of this easy to use. We are currently in the process of completely revamping uh, the platform that health evidence exists on and how it, is, how it functions and how it structures. It's structured and over uh, the next 8 to 12 weeks, um, we'll be working hard to finalize the, the new look of health evidence and its new platform, and you should be hearing from us towards the end of October about the relaunch uh, of the new site, and, and uh, hopefully you will all come uh, to see us again once we uh, are able to provide this new, new version. As I indicated earlier, the, this series of webinars that are being uh, hosted in 2012 and into the early part of 2013 have, have been funded by a knowledge translation supplement grant funded by CIHR, and we're grateful for the opportunity to have uh, these funds to be able to disseminate this knowledge across Canada and internationally on public health effectiveness. So the review that we are uh, discussing today was uh, completed in 2012 and focuses on the impact and effectiveness of intersectoral action to address the social determinants of health. And then finally, uh, the, the last little bit that you will hear from me today uh, is uh, we will be doing a, a very short evaluation of the webinar. Um, and, and in fact, we are using the data collected through these evaluations to tweak success of webinars as we uh, strive to continually meet the needs of our participants. So you will be receiving, uh, following the webinar today, an email. Uh, this is the address that you'll see uh, coming into your address box. Very short survey, uh, I guarantee you, will not take you longer than five minutes to complete, uh, mostly asking uh, your thoughts on whether or not the survey met your needs. So please, uh, if you can, fill that out for us as we are using that to tweak each one. So today I would like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce our uh, guest lecturer. We have uh, uh, Sume Ndumbe EO joining us from the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health, uh, as well Hannah Moffat from the Determinants of Health who was involved uh, in this review, uh, in the co-editing uh, uh, co and writing of this review. So let me just do a short uh, introduction for Sume, who will then be taking us uh, through the evidence and implications for policy and practice, and I, and I hope uh, answering questions uh, as well that, that you will be posting, uh, as well as other discussion that, that I hope we can have during uh, the next uh, 90 minutes. So Sume is a knowledge translation specialist at the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health. Sume has professional experiences in equity-focused organizational and community development and change, social justice education, HIV, AIDS prevention, research, knowledge translation, 
evaluation, and women's rights with local, provincial, and global organizations. Sume holds a Master's of Health Sciences in Health Promotion and, a global, and Global Health from the University of Toronto. So thank you very much, Sume, uh, for joining us today, and I'm uh, just going to uh, that introduction. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, great to be on the call today. Can everyone hear me properly? I know we were having some trouble with the sound earlier. Uh, there is a little hand button right below the participant list. So if you can hear me, either send a message through the chat or use that feature. Okay, so it looks like the sound is a little bit better. If you have any problems, please just let us know and we'll try to improve that. Uh, as Maureen mentioned, I'm Sumen Dumbe, AL with the National Collaborative Center for Determinants of Health, one of the co-authors of the review we're about to walk through today. Um, some of my colleagues are also on the line, and this work would not have happened without them, particularly Hannah Moffitt. Uh, the National Collaborative Center is one of six centers funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada as knowledge, tra knowledge translation mechanisms across the country. Our specific focus is on the social determinants of health and on health equity. And really, we work very closely with public health organizations across the country, both practitioners, decision makers, and researchers. Our work focuses on translating and sharing evidence to improve the social determinants of health and health equity. As I mentioned, we're one of six national collaborative centers. Some of you may be familiar with our sister NCCs um, focusing on Aboriginal health, environmental health, infectious diseases, methods and tools, as well as healthy public policy. So uh, just uh, before we move into the actual review, just want to let you know that we have a number of resources to support uh, your work. And you can visit us on our website at nccdh.ca. There you'll find a resource library on a range of tools and resources related to the social determinants of health and health equity. Uh, in June of this year, we launched Health Equity Clicks Community, which is an online space for public health practitioners to connect. Um, we're really thrilled that uh, there's been a great response. So if you're not yet a member, uh, you can check that out on our website. We also host Health Equity Clicks organizations, which is a place to learn about what different organizations across the country are doing. So if you're not yet listed and you think you're doing interesting work which we should know about, uh, you can contact us and we'll get you on that list. Uh, we also connect with practitioners through events like this and also in person through various conferences. Uh, we'll be, just if, if you'd like to meet us in person, we'll be in Toronto at the Health Promotion Ontario Conference next week. Also in BC at the Public Health Association of BC's conference in November and in Montreal for the Journée Annuelle de Santé Publique also in November. So just getting started into the review, as Maureen mentioned, uh, this review was published earlier this year in June and the review really looks at the impact and the effectiveness of intersectoral action on the social determinants of health. Uh, we used uh, an expedited systematic review process to get to the evidence which we'll, we'll be sharing with you today. Uh, we're not going to really focus very much on the methods, but if you have questions about that, um, please feel free to ask that as we go along and we'll do our best to respond to those questions. So we uh, focused on the general population. So we're using this approach called PICO. And uh, so we focused on the general population and included any population health intervention which really involved a relationship between more than one sector. Uh, the one requirement we had there was that public health had to be one of the sectors engaging in the intervention, and also that it had to be related to the social determinants of health and to health equity. Uh, our control group was open, so we really kept that broad. And we really tried to look at a broad set of health out of outcomes, so looking at uh, all measures of morbidity and mortality, uh, things like quality of life, adherence to health care, as well as social terms of health outcomes, so things like income, uh, gender, employment, housing, and all that. And we also looked at policy level outcomes, so thinking about whether or not there would be an organizational level changes or changes at a policy level. Uh, as Marie mentioned, health evidence uh, will have a summary statement available on the website, uh, which, and you can also download the review from our website. So just to give you a sense of what we found, we started with uh, just setting up some inclusion criteria. So as I mentioned, we included any population design. The studies had to have an explicit mention of uh, 
and intersectoral relationships. So by that, we, what we mean by that is we really wanted to, when we were reading the paper, we wanted to declare that it said public health, say, was involved with the education sector, and then it would have been included. Uh, we limited our study to articles published in French or in English between 2001 and 2012, and also to a couple of countries. So as you can see there, to Norway, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the U.S., and the U.K. Uh, after a very um, interesting process, we ended up including 17 articles. And to give you a sense, I think our initial search found about 10,000 articles. Uh, so these included one systematic review, 14 quantitative studies, and two qualitative studies. And we'll be going into some detail about what we found from those included studies. So before I get into talking about the individual studies, just to give you a sense of what we found uh, very generally, uh, we found evidence of effectiveness for interventions both at the upstream, midstream, and downstream levels. And um, we found that uh, because the interventions we found were so different, um, using this kind of classification really helped us make sense of what we found. So upstream interventions would be things which really uh, had the intent to change fundamental social structures and um, resource and power uh, redistribution. Midstream interventions tended to be more community-level changes which uh, tried to improve um, everyday living and working conditions. And downstream interventions were usually interventions which looked at uh, health care, so things like access to care and the like. Uh, we also set to look out to look at the role of the health sector in all of the interventions. And we found that while we, in some cases we could find out what the role was in most of the interventions, uh, the role really wasn't very clearly defined. To find out more about the actual interventions and the role of public health in those, you can actually read the review and in Table 2, you get a sense in the individual studies on the role public health played in those. Uh, the interventions included also tended to focus on specific populations and in all of all 17 studies focused on socially and economically disadvantaged populations. And I think what that means for us is um, what we can say how this generalizes to other population, I think is um, limited. And um, toward the end, I'll also talk about what we think that means for um, health equity more generally. Uh, a lot of the studies included were relatively short-term studies. I think we had one study which ha had a follow-up of 10 years. The majority of them were under two years. So uh, I think a limitation is that uh, the long-term effectiveness of a lot of interventions is not very clear. One of the things which we came out of this review feeling very, very strongly about, um, and I'll be interested in talking about that a little bit more with you all, is that there really is a need for more upstream interventions, and we think it's important that we as public health practitioners continue to advocate for the development and funding of research which actually measures the impact of intersectoral co collaborations at that level, because we really think that is where we're likely to see the greater impact on health equity and the social determinants. And generally, as a public health community, um, what we found was a number of interventions uh, focusing on early childhood showed some promise in terms of um, positive effects for children, especially in terms of early literacy with uh, low children of low-income mothers. We did include two upstream interventions, both focusing on housing and employment, so we think there is some evidence. Uh, we did not find reviews which focused studies which focus on any of the other social determinants. So based on our findings, um, we can't really say very much about other social determinants of health. Uh, the midstream interventions which we included uh, showed an improvement in terms of employment and working conditions, as well as child literacy, uh, oral health, housing, and organizational change. Uh, we had seven interventions which focused on downstream interventions, and those really um, showed an impact in terms of access to oral health services, immunization rates, as well as appropriate use of primary health services, and referrals to ready, school readiness checks for children. Now, I'm just going to take some time and talk about the interventions um, in a little bit more detail on what the itch found. So I'm going to be talking about them in terms of upstream interventions, and then move to speak about the, down, the midstream and then the downstream interventions. So two of our included studies focused on upstream interventions. The first one was set in the United States, and it focused on uh, agreements between states looking at uh, rehab rehabilitation. And what they found was organizations which participated in these agreements 
showed a 25% increase in the number of adults with disabilities who were supported into finding um, employment. Another of the in interventions looked at housing, and this is an Australian study. Uh, this is just some part of national legislation which focused on indigenous health. Uh, this part of the study actually just focused specifically on housing improvements. And so they looked at what happened after they had <coughs> excuse me, improvements to housing in um, a specific indigenous communities. Uh, they found that there was slight improvement in the actual condition of the houses, so a slight improvement in the infrastructure of the houses, uh, but there was no impact on hygienic conditions in those communities. And what we found from the upstream interventions is that there is some effectiveness, and we think it's important that we continue to implement upstream interventions. Um, but that said, we do think that the evidence base is limited. Now, if we think about uh, a lot of the reports we read around the social determinants of health and health equity, I think a lot of them really stress to the importance of upstream interventions. So we think it's really important that uh, these interventions be assessed so they, they actually make it into the evidence base and we can get a clear sense of what their impact on health equity is. Thinking about our midstream interventions, we had two studies which looked at employment and working conditions. Uh, one of them focused on employment for people with disabilities, and that showed an improvement in the number of people who participants who actually were able to in obtain and sustain employment. Uh, uh, this particular study found over 75% of participants actually were able to find employment through this program. Another study looked at really um, working conditions within a particular organization, and this involved a union and public health trying to improve working conditions. Uh, based on that study, there were very concrete changes made to the workplace at a policy level. One of the studies looked at childhood literacy, and this I found was a very interesting one, which was really looking at a number of interventions, about five interventions, and these interventions all had uh, they all shared a common component, and they looked to increase, improve early literacy behaviors amongst low-income families. And these found, along all the dimensions which they reported on, there was an increase in uh, an improvement in early literacy. So specifically, uh, we saw an increase in things like uh, the number of parents who said they actually read to their children daily, uh, parents reading aloud to their children, and also participating in uh, reading programs for children. Another housing study found that um, making mod modifications in the house um, resulted in a decrease in hospital admissions for those under 34 and a de decrease in housing related admissions. Uh, so I think in this case, um, we did see that incre uh, the decrease um, or those under 34, uh, for those above 35, the study didn't actually have any, the uh, intervention didn't seem to have any impact. Now I'm going to move on to interventions which looked at altering the social and physical environment. Uh, so what we grouped under here are things like a school-based policy. So really the focus was on uh, changing the school environment to make it a healthier environment. And in this case, we saw a we saw the implementation of a break time snack policy. And the outcome which was measured there was oral health, so really um, looking at childhood dental disease. And in this particular study, they found that for children, especially in the low socio socioeconomic status group, there was an improvement in dental health. Uh, another study looked at the impact of organizational change um, based on work of the collaborative, and they found uh, no impact on program integration or in policy change. Um, I know there's some cu questions coming up through the chat, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the presentation and then we'll come to your questions, so please do keep them coming. Uh, the collaboration mentioned earlier also uh, reported, uh, so this, they actually did not report any health outcomes, but they noted that there were a number of programs and policies which they think if a long-term evaluation of this initiative continues, they hope to see impact based on that. So what does this all mean uh, in a very practical sense? I think um, we can say with, um, based on the evidence that uh, implementing healthy school-based break time initiatives 
uh, can, show, can lead to an improvement in childhood dental disease. Uh, also, the evidence around intervening interventions for improving employment and working conditions, childhood literacy, dental health, and housing uh, is also supported. As well, um, I think a lot of us as public health practitioners engage in collaboratives, and I think it's interesting to think about the kinds of impact that work have. And the, uh, from this review, we do think there is some evidence which shows that um, those collaborate, collaboratives uh, can be really influential in terms of making organizational level change as well as advocating at the local, provincial, or federal level. Uh, the question which remains for us is thinking about um, how, how long-term these impacts are and what kind um, and how these can be sustained. Well, now I'm going to move into the downstream interventions. Um, seven of the included 17 studies actually focused on downstream interventions. And downstream interventions were really, as I mentioned earlier, interventions which looked at um, health care, so things like access to care and provision of health care service services. Uh, so uh, the first intervention we're going to talk about is an oral health intervention, which included both a school-based component as well as a home uh, visitation component, and really focused on oral health education. Uh, this intervention showed a reduction in cavities for children, as well as a more access to preventative care for the children included in the, pro in the intervention group. Another school-based program focused on mental health services for refugee children and showed a decrease in children reporting habit, children who reported having peer problems as well as hyperactivity. Uh, that said, um, the gap between the refugee students and the control groups in actual was not. It was reduced, but it still remained. Uh, the other study looked at immunization in a low-income neighborhood. I believe the study was set in the U.S. and really it looked at improving immunization rates uh, amongst African Americans and Hispanics in North, in New York City. And it involved work of 33 organizations, and each organization really had to integrate uh, immunization referrals as part of their regular service delivery. And this actually, I found, uh, if you notice, if you look at that number, I think is where we see probably one of the highest um, improvements. So there was an increase in immunization rates in that community from 46% to 80 uh, 0.5%. And I think this was probably one of the few studies where we actually saw the gap um, reduce on the basis of race in the intervention and control groups. Uh, uh, another, sticking with the downstream interventions, uh, another study looked at case co coordination and case management, and this focused on youth and seniors. Uh, this showed that there was an increase in the number of participants who were actually able to establish uh, a relationship with a primary care provider, so most, uh, most often a general practitioner, as well as there was a reduction in emergency room visits and an improvement in uh, diabetes control for the participants in the study. Uh, a school readiness program uh, set in New Zealand uh, in, a in a part of the country which really it was a rural community, a bit remote, uh, economically disadvantaged when compared to the rest of the population, uh, focused on training healthcare professionals to conduct and implement uh, school readiness checks for children. And these found that there was an inc improvement in the referral rates over the course of the program. And this particular program lasted for about uh, 10 months. Uh, another of the downstream interventions looked at uh, School, a school-based asthma education program and for low-income uh, ethnic minority students. Um, getting a message saying the sound has gone again. Are people having trouble hear, uh, hearing me? Uh, can you just provide responses in the chat box, please? Thank you. Okay, so it looks like for most people the sound is okay. Great, thank you. And so the, uh, the school-based asthma the school-based asthma education intervention actually showed no impact in the use of urgent health services or uh, among school in-school attendance for the low-income families. Uh, so what we um, can say about the downstream interventions as a whole is uh, there is some support that implementing interventions to improve access to education 
uh, as well as preventative or restorative dental care through either in school settings or in the community settings uh, has, can lead to improvement in oral health as well as access to care. Uh, also, I think if you look at the individual studies, there is some impact in terms of uh, improvement in mental health for refugee children as well as immunization coverage for uh, racialized communities as well as in chronic disease management and in school readiness. Uh, the evidence to support uh, school-based asthma programs in terms of uh, as an intersectoral action initiative is at this time not there in our initiative. In our review, sorry. Uh, so um, just um, before I conclude and talk about the general implications, uh, one of the things which um, I think for us really as we went through the literature which really we think is really important is the kinds of interventions which we found were really quite different. So I think it's really, for those of you who have not yet read the review, I would encourage you all to actually take a closer look at the interventions uh, and think about what people, um, what were actually, uh, the, what was actually being implemented. And also I think it's really important to think about the kinds of communities where these interventions were being in, uh, implemented as well as how the impact was being measured. So I'll give you an example. I'm just going to go back to that slide which talks about, uh, where are we? which talks about immunization, so if you look at the last bullet. So that particular study I found was quite interesting because they actually measured the improvement in immunization rates, say, in African, amongst African Americans and Hispanics and the general population. And so when we look at breaking down outcomes in terms of race and income, it's really interesting because you start to see really interesting variations. So in this study, while they found that immunization rates increase across the board, uh, the uptake, for example, in the Hispanic community was higher in the African American community. And I think at a program level, that can really give you a sense of how you either uh, tailor your programming, um, what may work with one community may not necessarily work with another, and really the things which we should be paying attention to as public health organizations, and also really what we measure. Uh, the other thing we found was, as you can see from uh, the outcomes that have been reported, Really, the outcomes being measured are so disparate. So some, sometimes we're talking about dental care, sometimes we're talking about school readiness. So really, I think it's important to think about what you are trying to do in your in your organization and what kinds of outcomes you think will be uh, most relevant in your community to keep track of. So uh, just to conclude and what this means for us overall, we think, um, based on the evidence, that there is evidence to support intervening in early childhood. I think um, when it comes to the social terms of health and health equity, uh, intervene, we know that the impact in early years is quite significant and continues throughout the life course. So really intervening you know, with children under the age of five and really, really young is really, a really important thing. Uh, there are interventions around uh, improving housing and employment conditions at the upstream, midstream, at the upstream level. Uh, midstream, as we mentioned, is evidence around employment and working conditions, childhood literacy, dental health, housing, and organizational change. And with the downstream interventions, there is evidence around uh, supporting access to oral health services, improving immunization rates. Uh, getting people connected to primary health care services as well as referrals for school readiness checks. Uh, so uh, I think this may be a good point for me to talk a little bit, um, just to answer that question which came in about the difference between upstream, midstream, and downstream interventions. Uh, so in terms of how we uh, define this, we looked at upstream interventions really as interventions which included a reform of fundamental social and economic structures and also which involved mechanisms uh, to redistribute wealth, power, opportunities, and decision-making capacities. And uh, we believe that these usually uh, occur at the structural and system level. Uh, midstream interventions, we considered interventions which looked at reducing risky behaviors or reducing exposures to hazards and influence um, by influencing health behaviors or psychosocial factors or improving um, material and working conditions. Uh, so um, to, add, to think about a specific intervention around midstream, uh, the intervention was in this study which looked at uh, a, high, a policy in a school. The reason why we consider that a midstream intervention is because the actual school environment was being changed. So the, a policy was implemented which said 
the school could no longer provide uh, sugary foods and had to provide um, certain things which were healthier. And so they decided to measure the impact on oral, on oral health. So the reason why that's the midstream is because the actual social and physical environment had been changed. So that's why I would consider that a midstream uh, intervention. Uh, a downstream intervention in our case usually occurred at the micro and individual level, and this really look at mitigating the impact of uh, upstream and midstream interventions, usually through increasing equitable access to healthcare services. So usually for most of the IF studies focused on healthcare, as you can see from here, then they were usually classified as downstream interventions. So I hope that answers the question uh, which was posed earlier. So um, we're done the formal part of the presentation, so at this time I'd like to invite uh, people to send in questions through the chat function and we'll start to read them out. Uh, while we wait for questions to come in through the chat, um, I'm just going to move to our, our online community. We had asked for people to send in questions in advance of the webinar. So, so we had a few questions come in there which um, uh, we'll respond to as we wait for questions to come in through the chat feature. The first question which we got in the online community came from uh, Dennis Raphael, who I'm sure is no stranger to most of you on the line. And his question really was around the role of public health in shifting broad conditions in which policy, public policy is made. Uh, so we think that's a really important thing, thinking about um, the role of public health and uh, public policy. Uh, one of the questions which we asked in this review, which we haven't really presented here today, is uh, thinking about the role of public health. What we found from the review was, as I mentioned earlier, the role of public health wasn't always well defined. Uh, in cases where that was, we did get a sense that public health was involved in a variety of ways, uh, usually uh, around policy, research, planning, practice, as well as funding. And so that included, we, we saw examples of public health uh, playing a role in leading, supporting, or participating in policy analysis, uh, policy analysis development, and advocacy. Uh, so an example of that could be uh, public health organizations providing technical support to other to community agencies, so, uh, say providing access to data or making sense of data which is available, and also participating in the development and implementation of policy. Uh, we also saw public health playing a role as a convener in uh, those intersectoral relationships, and also being able to identify appropriate interventions. Uh, in some cases, we saw public health providing uh, direct services. Uh, in terms of policy, our review didn't really find uh, very clear examples of public health playing a role in policy. That said, we do know that that exists. Um, we do have some resources posted online if you want to take a look at them. We think health in all policies uh, is an approach which has been talked about, which is getting some momentum around how we get um, public policies which help improve health equity in, across um, the in and out of, pu of public health. And so these are, there are some tools available, some of them out of Ontario. There's a recent report just published by the World Health Organization which looks at structures and actions around intersectoral governance for health in all policies. So uh, if you go on, you can take a look at that. Uh, so there is a question coming in. And the question is, can you tell us how your results compare with interventions listed on the Public Health Agency's best practice portal? Oh, I think that's a very good question. Uh, I'd say uh, I think we're com we can't really compare them because they're slightly, well, they're different things. Uh, the Public Health Agency's Best Practice Portal is a collection of a range of interventions which focus on, uh, which focus on a range of um, issues. Uh, so I think it provides a, a different kind of evidence. We focus on a particular thing, and so our, the interventions which we include here, as we mentioned earlier, are interventions which look at the, relation, the impact of the relationship between public health and other sectors. Um, I, would, I would imagine that they include interventions which are outside of that. But do we have any other questions? Okay, so I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, Maureen? Sorry, Sumay? Hi. 
so I, I have, there are a couple of other questions that have come in. Uh, one question is, um, can you provide specific examples of midstream interventions of oral health? Okay, so uh, thanks for that. I think we just saw, I responded to that earlier, uh, going back to uh, the example which was listed here, and I'm going to flip back to that slide. Okay, so the first bullet point there talks about the school-based snack uh, initiative, which focused, which um, improved uh, dental health for children. Maureen, were there any other questions? Yes, there was uh, one additional question uh, that says, on the midstream interventions on social and physical health, did this include studies by Dr. Paul Vogler's and Apple Schools? Paul Vogler and Apple Schools, um, no it didn't. And uh, could the person who uh, asked that question just to provide a sense of that. So. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, for interventions to be included, they had to have had sort of an, a very explicit mention saying public health was involved and the uh, educational, let's say the education sector was involved. So uh, one of the things which we talk about in the report itself is that um, we, it's very likely that interventions which may have included public health and other sectors are not included in this review just because it wasn't explicitly stated in the actual paper. So I see another question there. Which, uh, the question is, do your upstream, midstream, and downstream interventions mirror the universal selected indicated interventions model? And I have to say I'm not very familiar with that model, so I'm not sure if they do. Um, the one thing which it does, uh, it is making me think about is we did talk about uh, the ways in which interventions approached health equity, so whether or not it was sort of a universal intervention. And so universal intervention which really would be delivered to the entire population. Uh, we talked about whether or not it was a targeted intervention, which means only people who met a specific criteria. So, for example, if you say, you know, low-income racialized women living in Toronto would be eligible to receive the intervention. And also interventions which were mixed, so were available to everyone, but specific attention paid to particular groups. I'm not sure if that, if that model is similar to the universal selected indicated uh, model you talk about. Sumi, just a, a, a question that was uh, posed by Carrie Robinson. What are some key implications for what we should measure or evaluate regarding intersectoral interventions to add to the evidence base? Thanks for that question. Uh, so in terms of uh, implications for evaluation, uh, I think one of the key things is, um, which I mentioned earlier, is really the need to uh, evaluate the impact of upstream interventions. Uh, we think there really is a need for more rigorous ev evaluation, which really takes into account the complexity of uh, most of these initiatives. And uh, in those kinds of in evaluations, I think it would be important to talk about uh, the different roles that uh, different sectors play, uh, how those different roles contribute to the observed outcome. So I think it would be interesting to talk about uh, does it matter if public health is involved or not? So would we be as well off if uh, an intervention is carried out, say, in a school setting and public health is not part of that, or is it, very, is it absolutely integral that public health be a part of that conversation? Uh, also in terms of evaluations, uh, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the studies were short term. We really think uh, there is a need for more controlled designs as well, which have uh, long term follow ups. And that would really would help us um, think about uh, trends over time. And we don't think this is something which public health has to do alone. Uh, we think there is um, there are contributions which can be made from sectors outside of public health. So really uh, taking sort of an interdisciplinary approach to evaluation, and we think it's an important thing. Uh, talking about the the, kind, the studies which we found uh, 
a lot of the studies which we included were uh, sort of from the, the quality range from moderate to weak. So uh, we think the actual study designs of individual studies need to be improved. And one thing which we actually thought was important, I'm not sure, um, I'm, my, I'm assuming that a lot of people who are on the call today work in public health organizations. I'm hoping we have some researchers on the line. Uh, but we really found that uh, a lot of the articles which made it in, which had sort of public health involved, in a lot of them, a relationship between the public health organizations and our research institution really, we think, helped actually get that um, evidence into the evidence base. So for those of you, uh, who have um, researchers you can call in to help you. We think that would really be a good, uh, good thing in terms of our capacity building and support for evaluation. And as um, the other thing which we think is important is uh, an improvement in the funding mechanisms uh, uh, to support intersexual action. And uh, one of the things which we didn't find actually was a lot of information on the cost of um, this uh, intervention. So. Only a handful of studies are found that we think it's an important thing to report uh, how the cost effectiveness of these interventions. So Sumi, I see that there are, there are several uh, questions that are coming in, so I'm just going to interject here and there to make sure that uh, we can do our best in answering them. So uh, one that, that uh, came in a little while ago uh, it asks, would you have recommendations for who should be included in an intersectoral group to address upstream determinants? That's a great question. Who should be included? Uh, uh, one of the initiatives we're working on with, uh, at the center is on leadership, uh, looking at uh, how leadership influences action on the social determinants of health and health equity. Uh, so um, I'd say that I think leadership is an important thing. and. Uh, both leadership at a formal level and an informal level. In some of the studies included in this review, we saw we saw people um, people in all sorts of roles involved. So we saw community health workers, we saw nurses, we saw health promoters, we saw people who were directors of um, public health, uh, a whole range. So uh, I'd say I think it's important to have people along the spectrum, uh, but definitely important to have people who sort of have access to resources and who actually make decisions around how resources are allocated. Thanks, Sume. And uh, just continuing on with that, there's been a request for you to explain a little more on the upstream approach. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, I'm thinking it may be helpful to talk about uh, maybe some very concrete examples. So um, I think an upstream approach could be uh, let's get, think about it. So, if say, so Quebec, for example, has um, legislation which requires uh, government institutions to actually conduct health impact assessments uh, when they have new policies. So that is upstream in the sense that it is actually embedded in law. So there is a really clear accountability mechanism. So if I was say working in the transportation department in that province, then I'm required to actually run, run an analysis of what I think the impact on health is going to be on that particular policy, which means that if there are potential detrimental impacts, then, either you, then you can have a conversation around whether or not you continue that policy, and if you do, uh, what kinds of um, support do you need to put in place, or maybe you don't go ahead with it, or how do you readjust it? So the reason uh, we would say that's an upstream intervention is that it is, you know, it's supported by legislation, it is embedded in the system, so there's actually a change across the whole system. Uh, another example you can think about is um, there's a lot of work going on around the country around uh, campaigns around minimum wage. Um, usually in those groups, I find those groups are usually very intersectoral, so you'll see people from the labor movement involved, you'd see people from municipalities involved, and a lot of them you'd see public health involved, uh, the social service sectors actively involved. And so if, uh, if a city, for example, passes passes uh, a policy saying if you want to do procurement with, say, the city of Toronto, uh, you have to provide a living wage for all your employees or for employees who are funded through this particular contract, then that we think would be sort of an upstream change because you've actually changed the way in which uh, resources are then allocated across the board. Thanks, Sume. That's an um, excellent uh, answer to that question. Another one that's come in is how likely 
are the interventions that were found to positively influence the target population be implemented on a long-term basis? So how likely are they to be implemented? Uh, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think one of the things which we're very, we, which I'm very um, sure about is uh, what studies report may not necessarily be throughout the course of the implementation. I'm thinking to one specific uh, study, so the systematic review which we included, uh, this was set in the UK and it focused on a number of really large scale policy interventions uh, which uh, the government has been testing out. And I think that actually could help answer your question because um, one of the things they found, so they included things like, um, some of you may be familiar with uh, health action zones or health improvement programs. Um, one of the things they found is uh, a lot of those interventions were short term. And so sometimes interventions would be funded for, say, as pilot projects, so they'd be funded for a three to five year period and then after the five years, uh, they would the funding will end uh, whether or not that um, is actually you can actually you know stretch that to other interventions I think we need to do, uh, use some caution um, with that but I think if we just think about our own experiences in terms of the work we do a lot of public health interventions unfortunately are uh, funded as pilot projects and are not necessarily continued long term so I do think um, so from my very personal perspective, can they be long-term? I think they can be, and I actually think they should be. Are they usually? Sometimes not, but not always. Thanks very much, Sume. And, um, you know, it is, it's, it's a difficult issue, I'm sure, in terms of uh, thinking about how to leverage uh, funding in the longer term. Uh, also knowing that in many instances political cycles uh, aren't in the long term. So how do we actually think about reframing the issue around that? Uh, I'm just going to move us on because uh, we uh, it's great to see so many comments and questions coming in. I'd like to make sure we can get to as many of them as possible. I'm just going to jump down now to uh, something that's come in, in under the Q&A. So the, the question being, do you agree that more funding should be placed in social housing and support for nonprofit groups such as the Portland Health Society? What's the name of the society? Sorry, Maureen, could you um, re-read the question? Sorry, yes, I'll reread that. Do you agree that more funding should be placed in social housing and support for nonprofit groups such as the Portland Health Society? Uh, I'll admit I'm not uh, a social housing expert by any means. Um, what The little I do know does um, indicate that there are uh, extremely long wait times for social housing in most provinces and most cities. Uh, uh, I think Wellesley Institute has done some work in this area and some of the work does hint that there is uh, a need for more more resourcing of that uh, system. I'm not familiar with the particular organization so I can't really speak to that but I think uh, overall uh, social housing. But I think even if you move from social housing just to uh, the <clears throat> the area of the social terms of health, if you think about transportation, education, uh, work around gender equity, um, anti-racism, I do think uh, they could, we could think about how we uh, raise support. And Maureen just really, I think, raised a really important point about how we align the work we do as a sector with um, sort of political cycles and how we engage in advocacy and policy development in this issue. So I think we do need to be savvy when it comes to sort of policy development and engaging in the policy uh, policy process, and that may help um, increase the support we have for initiatives like social housing initiatives. Uh, another question here is: Did your analysis consider research based on multi-level and multiple intervention, or the multiple intervention model, as suggested by uh, Dr. Nancy Edwards? Uh, great question. Uh, we did look at that, uh, not necessarily as a specific uh, question, but when we looked at interventions, uh, one, I think there was one of the studies which we included where we actually report 
people to those outcomes at a midstream level and a downstream level, and that there was only one. And that was uh, the, this was the collaborative which talked about, which reported organizational change as well as advocacy uh, at different levels. And they also reported sort of uh, improvements in terms of case management and uh, case coordination. I think that's a really important point because uh, if you think about how you measure the impact you have, I think it's important to measure you know, impact at the individual level as well as you know, the community and then the systems at uh, system levels. Most of the studies we found didn't do that. Usually they focused on just one, and just um, one of the studies actually looked at that. Uh, a comment or another question asks uh, for you to speak to the opportunities provided by public health being invited or engaged through service delivery and how to move those opportunities towards involvement in upstream interventions? Uh, great question. Uh, so um, the, the interventions we found, so if you think about uh, focusing on the downstream interventions, so usually in those you'd see public health working alongside our, our colleagues in the primary health care sector. Uh, the opportunity which I think that provides is I think it provides it really provides a space to ask why. Why are we seeing more low-income people come through our services? Why are we seeing more people of color come into our doors? Why are we seeing uh, seniors not getting the kind of care they need? Uh, uh, why are we seeing more indigenous people come through our doors? So I think if we start to ask, uh, if we start to engage in those kinds of conversations in the actual health care sector, then it provides us an opportunity to really expand the conversation and not just say, um, we need better outreach, which I think we absolutely do. But think about, okay, after we provide better outreach to those communities, after we make our services more culturally appropriate, which, again, are really critical, what else do we need to do? What, how can we you know, intervene so that we see less of that happening? And if we're able to shift the conversation, then I think it gets, gets us a step closer. Uh, I'm just thinking about something I saw recently, which came from... Uh, which is a tool for doctors. I found it was a really interesting tool because it's used, I think, I'm not a clinician, but I can imagine that for clinicians it would be a useful tool. And I'm just going to try finding it as I speak. And this really is by, it's, uh, it's by the, it's published by the Ontario College of Family Physicians. And it's actually a tool, it's called the Poverty Tool. It's a, uh, it's a resource which is, at, which is used as a clinical tool. And it's interesting because it actually, has very specific questions around uh, screening and adjusting. So uh, an example of the questions they found, I just pulled that up, is uh, asking a question like, do you ever have difficulties making ends meet at the end of the month? And so that's something which you can do sort of during your intake, and it's a question which you can ask everyone. And depending on the response you get, then you can, you can then redirect people to resources which can then support them. The other interesting thing I found about this tool is it actually then provides you with things like asking people to, if you're low income, are you receiving the right kinds of you know government supports which are available to you? So um, we can send out a link to that um, when we send out a little thank you at the end of the of the uh, webinar. Actually, I'm going to post it in the chat as we speak. So th thank you, uh, Sume. Um, and, and this really is so exciting to see uh, so many comments and questions uh, coming in. And, and also thank you, Sume, for um, uh, answering, having such good answers for, for these questions. So another one uh, that is related to the, the literature review asks, in the literature search, did you find evidence for language and culturally appropriate healthcare services or community programs? Okay, perfect. Uh, there's also a question about studies focused to public transit access, so I'll just answer them at the same time. Uh, we didn't find any studies related to public transit access, and I don't think we found any around language and cultural accessibility. And as I say that, I just want to stress that um, I was going to be that we were looking at interventions based on intersectoral action. So they, those interventions may exist, but they just may not exist from sort of an intersectoral collaboration perspective. And I can jump in there as well, not for um, 
evidence uh, related to this particular question around intercollaboration, but in a review that I did for a health department about four years ago now, where they were interested in uh, increasing utilization of their prenatal care services, uh, particularly amongst uh, new immigrants to Canada, uh, we did find uh, in that literature um, that paying attention to uh, uh, cultural issues and language was very important and was associated with increased uptake. Uh, so uh, if, if you're interested uh, in um, learning more about that, perhaps um, you could connect with me uh, uh, after the, the webinar and uh, I will see what I can do about um, getting permission uh, to um, post that uh, review that a health department uh, uh, commissioned. Uh, Thanks, I love this next question that's uh, come in here, so I'll just read that out. Uh, as, as frontline registered nurses in public health, we rarely get the opportunity to work on upstream interventions. We mostly do downstream. Do you have any suggestions on how we can focus on more upstream interventions on a daily basis and as part of our role as public health nurses? Thanks for that question. So. Uh, I think uh, Claire Bedcart is on the line. I'm not sure, but unfortunately, uh, she doesn't have any voice. But Claire, if you're on the line and you want to type a response, I think that question is right up your alley. Uh, but I'll take my best shot at it. Uh, I think one of the ways in which uh, nurses can do that is by engaging with your association. So in Ontario, the RNAO, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, is very active in policy initiatives and advocacy work around uh, the social terms of health and health equity. So I think that is a, a good channel to engage in. Uh, the national, at the national level, uh, CNA is um, involved in similar work. Uh, so I think those are easy ways. And those organizations, those associations, I think also in a position to help shift organizations uh, in terms of redefining what is within the scope of your practice as a nurse. So uh, engaging with them, I think, can help um, make this a legitimate part of work, your work as a public health nurse. And I think that actually um, can probably extend to other um, practitioners in public health, so be it public health inspectors, um, health promoters, and uh, other and doctors, you know, uh, I think our professional associations are a great outlet for that. And I'll, I'll just add to it well uh, as well. First, uh, the comment, I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but uh, Claire uh, Betker suggesting the Community Health Nurses of Canada uh, also are working on this. And um, when I think back on uh, my time as a public health nurse, which although is, is, is kind of a long time ago now, um, I, I think what it might also require, Amanda, is to be thinking about the many different roles that we can have as public health nurses. And so in the immediate um, short term, uh, perhaps, you know, nurses still would continue to spend a fair amount of their time on the, on the downstream interventions that, that you would be working on now. Uh, but engaging in uh, other types of activities uh, working with community groups, um, engaging in uh, advocacy. Uh, so there, there, it might be an, an adding on um, these additional uh, types of activities that would lead to a more systems level uh, type of policy or, or uh, approach. And um, I mean, certainly I know, I know from my own training that uh, learning about advocacy wasn't something that was included uh, in my nursing training that um, likely has changed uh, somewhat in nursing education now, um, but it can be something that, that perhaps nurses might also want to engage in public health nurses in terms of uh, what additional skills can they um, add in terms of professional development to make them uh, effective in terms of advocacy and in engaging in other types of community groups along this way. So I think part of it might be um, a, a reframing of, of public health nursing roles that that is doing both interventions that that uh, have more immediate impact as well as that broader term, broader level, longer term systems uh, type of approach. 
Thanks, Maureen. Uh, so another question that we have here is why did you choose not to include interventions that did not mention public health? Given the social determinants of health often lie outside the health sector, does public health need to have a leadership role and thus be mentioned in the study? So I'll let you take a stab at that, Sume. Hey, thanks for that question. And I think there's also a similar question about why we separated public health and primary health care. Uh, so I'll try to address both of them at the same time. Uh, I think that it was, that's really a good question because as a team, it's something which we went back and forth um, quite a bit. Um, I'm guessing Hannah and Claire are probably laughing as I say this. Uh, it's thinking about why why do we want to focus on public health. And where we landed for us is, as I mentioned earlier, as an organization, what we have heard um, largely through a scan we did uh, last year is um, the public, we really think it's important to focus on what public health can do. And one of the ways in which we can do that is really looking at what the literature says about what public health actually does, uh, which is why we decided to focus on interventions which really had to clearly involve public health. And for us, we thought that would let us actually say, okay, so in these kinds of interventions, these are the range of roles in which we see public health uh, play. Uh, why public health specifically, and not just group that with primary health care? Uh, because the way in which our sort of health care system is set up, uh, in most places, public health has a role which is unique from uh, primary health care, so it's not necessarily just uh, service delivery, there's a lot of prevention and health promotion. So we thought it was important to actually separate that and move and not think about just uh, health care and so the delivery of services, but focus on really the what I, I would, we really would consider is core public health work. So that was sort of the rationale for that. And well, I think I'm missing part of the question. The question around leadership. Uh, we Public health did not have to, have to play a leadership role to have been included, so we included it regardless of the kind of role um, public health played. So in some of the studies, um, public health was not, was just, was just you know, one of the other partners. So I'm thinking there was one initiative which was actually led by university, and public health was one of 25 people involved. So whether or not public health was involved as a partner, or whether or not they were leading it, whether or not they were just called in uh, to provide advice at any point, as long as they were involved in some way, then they were included. Thanks very much. And, and just to uh, remind everyone that we will be uh, posting the slide deck, uh, the summary that was provided today in both English and French, as well as over the next few days, the audio file from uh, today's uh, session and so uh, all of these questions and their answers will be available to you in an audio way uh, if you wanted to re -li uh, listen to it again or uh, in fact um, encourage colleagues to listen as well. Uh, I see a, a question here um, that asks what were some tangible examples of advocacy at the frontline level. Again an excellent question and actually I see uh, some comments here from uh, Claire Becker that I think are appropriate and it's, it just says always thinking upstream and looking for opportunities to act either as an initiator, a doer, nudger, leader or a supporter which I think fits in uh, really well there and, and I guess in terms of a, um, again I guess some more local examples would be um, uh, sitting on task groups um, and other types of uh, community level groups that are working on these issues and um, being able to integrate into that the, the, the evidence that is emerging from reviews such as the one that was presented today. Yeah, I'm just so quickly, uh, go ahead. I was just agreeing, I think, um, and I th and I think a lot of people are probably already involved in things like, you know, poverty reduction networks. Uh, I mentioned earlier minimum wage campaigns. Someone asked about um, public uh, access to public transit. I know that in in Toronto they are pu public health is part of those tables and part of those conversations. So I would agree with um, the comments from Maureen and Claire. Great, thank you. I might have missed this so far. You've already answered it, Sume. Uh, just let me know. There's one that came in that said, based on your definition of intersectoral, 
actions undertaken by sectors outside of the health sector, why do you separate public health and primary health care? I think we just answered that one before. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm reading and um, listening and uh, trying to think of answers all at the same time, obviously not doing that very well. Uh, okay, so another question here is, how long was the follow-up on the school-based break time snack, and did they address other outcomes such as academic performance? Okay, thanks for that. I'm just, I just need a quick moment to flip through there to find that particular study. Uh, so the school break time snack, the follow-up was... Uh, they had a two-year follow-up. Uh, the measures which they actually report in this particular study uh, was only childhood dental disease. So they don't report anything else, like um, they don't report academic performance or anything else. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, and I, I, I'm going to take a first stab at this question, and then Sume, uh, if you have anything to add, please go ahead. Uh, and Claire, if you want to type something also, uh, please go ahead. The, the, the question being re-nurse advocacy role, might this be viewed as overstepping their professional bounds, similar to scientists advocating for protecting the planet rather than just presenting the facts? Um, this is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, question and actually one that I think requires uh, much debate across uh, the public health sector and, and among uh, public health uh, nurses. Um, I, I guess I presented my view, which is that I think there is a role for nurses to play in advocacy and also in uh, um, bringing to that advocacy role the best available evidence uh, that's been uh, critiqued and found to be of, of high quality. Uh, I, I think that that is stepping outside of the traditional public health role, but in fact I would um, uh, expect that that there are a number of public health nurses that have already been playing this role for many years, uh, and and so uh, you know I guess I ha that's one opinion that I that I have. I would suspect that there are many uh, around what that role is, but I think we need to keep in mind, uh, certainly in the 25 years that I've been involved in public health, that uh, the, the public health role uh, and activities and even how we define what public health is in Canada, it consistently changes uh, and, and uh, seems to uh, expand. And so I would, um, I guess, suggest that uh, if this isn't a role that, that nurses are thinking about as, as being something that they would be doing, that maybe it's time to be thinking about whether or not they should be. Sume, anything else to add there? Yes, thanks, Maureen. Uh, Claire just sent in a note uh, saying nurses remember a code of ethics. So uh, I would imagine that the code of ethics for nurses talks about um, involvement in community action and advocacy. And um, I, it's something I think about um, advocacy, policy development from a place of public health. Uh, I go back to the Ottawa Charter because I just remember it being drilled into my head a couple of years ago. Um, and I think if you think about the Ottawa Charter, one of the things which in my mind it's very clear about is it talks about what the prerequisites for health are things like peace, shelter, education, food, income, a stable ecosystem, sustainable resources, social justice, and equity. And the Ottawa Charter actually has the word advocate in it, right? So it says we need to, health promotion action aims at making those conditions favorable through advocacy for health. Uh, so while, I think while it may not always be easy and we may not always um, have that as our immediate scope of practice, I think we have a lot of um, really seminal documents and reports both at a national and global level which actually support um, public health engaging in advocacy and policy development. And I always find it I find it useful to always go back to that if I have if I if say the legitimacy of what I'm talking about is called into question, I feel I think being able to have something like that to fall back on and say, Well, if we go back to what we talk about and say we're built on, then that actually says we should be doing that. And I find that that's sometimes helpful in helping to move the conversation forward. Thanks, Sume. And uh, I see one additional question here that asks, uh, did you consider including the impact of community health center-led community health initiatives in this or uh, another review? 
great question. Uh, we did consider it. It was that's another one of the points where we sat and we thought, okay, we went back and forth a million times, and um, we decided not to include community health centers. Uh, so if it was just say a community health center and not public health, then it was not going to be included. Um, we are working on other reviews, so that's a, really it's a nice segue. Um, we're actually just about to start a review on community engagement and the, and, and the social terms of health and health equity. So I suspect that in that work, um, we'll probably see a lot of initiatives which, have, which are community-led um, around the social terms of health and health equity. Uh, we just in the very preliminary stages of that, so I'd say look out for that uh, early sort of term. Uh, uh, also, if you're not on our list um, and you'd like to sign up, uh, our contact information is available at the end of this, and you can do that through. Our website. You can uh, get a sense of what we're up to, and um, when we have something new, you'll get a little email letting you know about that. Great, thanks. Thank you, Sumei. And uh, there was just another comment that uh, asked us to talk a little bit about the re review process. So I'll just take a quick quick stab, and it's not just in relation to the review that we were discussing uh, today, but just more uh, generally. Um, you know, in 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 terms of a, a process, um, uh, you know, a systematic review involves uh, the development of a clear, focused question, whereby you clearly articulate the population that you're interested in, the intervention or interventions that you want to know about, what you're comparing those interventions to, and then finally what outcomes you are specifically interested in, in learning about. And so all of those things together would make up a clearly defined question. And once you have that clearly defined question, you want to conduct a comprehensive search for all of the available evidence, whether that exists in the published domain uh, and the unpublished domain, you need a strategy that will help you to find all of that evidence. Uh, because what you don't want to do is to, um, in, the, uh, in the way that you create your search strategy, to omit, uh, miss a certain number of studies that might all have a certain type of outcome. So for example, uh, it, you know, if, if you only look for published studies, uh, and didn't look for anything that's uh, unpublished, uh, there could be some bias there in, in those studies that aren't, pu that aren't uh, published and you'd be missing that from your data set. Once you have uh, conducted uh, a, a comprehensive search and you've made um, explicit uh, how you've made decisions on uh, which studies will be included and which ones will be excluded, now you need to go about determining uh, the quality of that evidence. So for, for whatever is the appropriate types of criterion for the kind of evidence you're looking at. So for example, if you were uh, doing a review that, that included qualitative studies, you would want to use um, criterion that identify good methodological quality qualitative studies. And if you were doing a randomized, uh, looking at randomized control trials on the effectiveness of an intervention, you would want to use uh, uh, criterion that are good at distinguishing good quality randomized control trials. So you need to assess the quality uh, of the studies and from there identify the, the highest quality evidence and then use a very rigorous process for extracting all of the relevant data. Uh, one of the things that is really important in the review process is that more than one person be involved in doing all of this work. So usually this would mean you would have a minimum of uh, two people independently assessing all of these studies, coming uh, to their, uh, their own decision about, for example, the quality, and then coming together uh, to discuss whether or not uh, these two, uh, two people agreed on those ratings. So the whole process needs to be very explicit uh, and uh, quite methodical, and uh, therefore um, can take a fair amount of time, even though now we have expedited reviews happening uh, that are helping to move through this process uh, a little bit more uh, quickly. Uh, so having done a number of systematic reviews myself, they're um, uh, actually quite interesting to work on. It's a great opportunity to get uh, really ingrained in a whole body of literature uh, and, and really feel like you understand it uh, well, but, uh, but it's also 
um, you know, takes a fair amount of uh, time and thinking power to work your way through that. That being said, there's uh, um, several of us, uh, the National Collaborating Centre for Methods and Tools, uh, we know here from the um, National Collaborating Centre for Determinants of Health, um, uh, as well as other folks at McMaster University that have lots of skill in doing systematic reviews and would be happy to speak to anyone further uh, about developing those skills, helping you develop those skills if you were interested in learning about that. Um, I see just a, a, a comment that someone made based on uh, what I had said earlier about the role of public health nurses uh, and advocacy and, and the comment being that uh, what was said, I strongly support your comments, Maureen, regarding the nurse's advocate. This word in Latin means to speak for and when we work with uh, social determinants of health, we often have the opportunity to speak for and with clients through community development and partnerships. Uh, so thank you for that comment, and uh, really, I, 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 I guess I'm just trying to promote a dialogue here, and I think that it is really important um, that uh, within public health we talk about these new and emerging roles uh, and uh, what we can do to prepare ourselves for those roles. Um, another question, I'm going to send this back to you, Sume. I think we'll just have time for another one or two questions before signing off. But the question is, when you refer to health equity, do you mean equitable access to health care? Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, when we do these, we normally throw up a definition of health equity, which we did not do today, so my apologies for that. Um, when we're talking about health equity, uh, we, I think that includes equitable access to health care, but it also goes beyond that. So really, um, when we talk about health equity, we're thinking about uh, the absence of differences in health uh, among, in population groups, and we're thinking about population groups in terms of socially defined, economically, demographically defined, um, and so the absence of differences which you will consider unfair and avoidable. Uh, along those dimensions, so that really would go beyond healthcare, uh, but that definitely does include it. Great, thanks, uh, Sume. And uh, I'm just going to um, read out a last comment that I think really is a a great way to uh, uh, end end the webinar and uh, excellent feedback for us to take back to our respective groups and thinking about reviews. So the comment is. Uh, whether or not an initiative includes public health actors or even frames the issue as a social determinant of, of health, it would be good to include such initiatives in a future review. It might show where public health actors could expand their role or involvement in future work. And, uh, you know, I think that is uh, an excellent uh, point. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of it, I think, many times comes down to what is the question that we are trying to answer in, in, a, re, in a systematic review. Uh, and while uh, there was a, a very clear question um, identified that, that took the review we've been discussing today, today down a certain path, it might be a broader type of question uh, that is, you know, what are all of the, the initiatives that are going, out, going on in relation to social determinants of health? And uh, um, the findings of that one could use in thinking about where where might this have implications uh, for public health. So likely, um, I'd actually be quite scared to see what the uh, hits would be on the search for that. If there were 10,000 for the current review, then that would likely be uh, significantly higher than that. But but uh, a point well taken. So I would just like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank Sume for uh, joining us today. I'm, I'm uh, uh, really indebted to having you on, on the phone, uh, knowing this evidence so well and having put so much thought into what the findings really mean for public health practice and for social determinants of health. So thank you very much for uh, being on the line today. Uh, again, around the online conversation through Health Equity Clicks, uh, uh, you were asked to post questions, uh, and as well, um, Sumi, I just I might just ask you here if there are additional questions that people have, would you like them to uh, post those now or in the coming uh, days to Health Equity Clicks? Great, um, thanks, Marina. It's great being on, and just to see um, 
I'm thrilled that there were tons of questions coming in. Really shows that there is a lot of interest in this area. Uh, we would uh, like to continue the conversation online in our online community. So. If you're a member, you can log in and post your questions. Uh, we'll keep that discussion open, but um, I think it'd be nice to get questions coming in uh, immediately following the, the webinar so we can respond to them and then get those back to you. Uh, but the community is always there for this and other conversations. Um, there's been a lot of talk about sort of policy development and advocacy, which is making me think that is a great topic to discuss in that space. So. Uh, you can and you can also contact me. Uh, my email is included in the presentation. Great, thanks very much, Sume. And um, with that, I would just again like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, really uh, wonderful to see so many of you being able to stay on the line for the uh, whole 90 minutes. Uh, this obviously is a, uh, a high priority topic in our country. Uh, and 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 abroad, and uh, really, I think we all need to learn from each other in terms of sessions like this that allow us to debate and dialogue and discuss uh, what we're doing. So just finally, again, just a reminder that you will be receiving an email uh, asking you to complete a very short uh, survey about how uh, today went and your thoughts for the future. Uh, we will be hosting additional webinars. Our next one is coming up. Um, in a few weeks, uh, and I would encourage all of you to be on the lookout for uh, our uh, newsletters and, and blurbs about that. Uh, so thank you once again to everyone for being with us today, and hopefully uh, we'll see you again. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.